this week on the Back Table Podcast. What are some of the other benefits aside from easier AU status? Oh, big one, marketing. So now you're going to come out. Now you're marketing yourself and looking for jobs. Think about going into a practice where they have group of whatever number of practitioners. And mind you, majority of the IR practice is still private practice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of private practices may require somebody who's doing, who's an authorized user and may want to kickstart their Y90 program or have an additional hand in Y90 program. Now you join a private practice where it's all about moving fast and making sure your patients are taken care of and all that stuff, right? You are ready on July versus you waiting 18 months. It makes a huge difference. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things endovascular or otherwise minimally invasive. I'd like to thank our listeners for tuning in and encourage you to subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on Twitter or email to let us know how we can make this a more valuable resource for the endovascular community. This is Michael Barraza returning as your host, recording from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Today, we're going to be talking about the path to becoming an authorized user for nuclear medicine practice as an interventional radiologist. Joining me today is Dr. Rakesh Ahuja, coming to you from Philly. Rocky is finishing up his IR residency at Einstein, where he actually managed to become an authorized user during training. Rocky, thanks for taking the time to share your experience. Thank you for having me, Michael. I really appreciate it. This is an amazing podcast, and I'm sure there's going to be many intriguing minds in finding out this complex method of becoming an authorized user. Thanks, Rocky. We appreciate it. Uh, we always appreciate the support. So what's, uh, what's happening next for you in July? So I'm headed to Boston for uh, an additional year of training in pediatric IR. And then we'll see where I end up after that. And uh, hopefully I can practice adult and peds IR. That would be great. There are lots of places you can do that, including here. We'll hire you. I'm doing <laughs> a little bit of both. Uh, so what made you want to do peds? So I'm very fascinated with vascular malformation and complex pediatric cool. interventions. My mentor who I worked with ignited my passion in this field and somehow got connected to Boston Children's, did the interview, and now I'm headed there. It's a good place to be. Uh, I'm excited for you, man. You've done a, a really fantastic job of getting involved with SAR and the National IR community as a resident, and I look forward to your future contributions as a fellow and beyond. I appreciate it. I have been very fortunate to have great mentors. Yeah, well, you put in plenty of effort on your part. So let's dive into this. We're going to start by reviewing some of the basics about authorized users and interventional radiology. Then we're going to go through the process of becoming an authorized user and some of the challenges that have arisen in recent years. And then we'll finish up by hearing about how you managed to become an AU during training and what that means for you going forward. That's great. All right, Rocky, to kick this off, why don't you break down for our listeners what an authorized user actually is and generally speaking, what they're authorized to use. So authorized user is just basically somebody who has met the criteria. And for the sake of interventional world, we are going to keep this as Y90 authorized user from moving forward because the the way to become an I-131 authorized user is slightly different. Huh. Yeah. Uh, and you have to go through, you have to fill forms A, forms B, which is part of your residency training. And now the ABR has given the authorization for IR, DR, and DR. So they all are the same. But the method to become an AU for what I-131 and the other treatments are completely different. I wouldn't say completely different. It's similar, but there is additional things that you need for yeah. Y90. So for Y90 is what we're going to talk about today because that's relevant to our practice, right? So in, in a nutshell, authorized user is somebody who has met the criteria and can prescribe Y90 as the radiation treatment for uh, intervention as part of interventional oncology. Okay, got it. And the majority, the, the important aspect of becoming AU is that you basically are in charge, not just for those delivery, those calculations, but anything that happens around the procedure is also your responsibility. Like if the spill happens, how the delivery systems are set up and the timing, the timeouts, all that stuff is, is your responsibility. That's why you as an authorized user have to go through this rigorous requirements because it has major implications. Right on. So you're an authorized user. Who's doing the authorizing or what's the authority that's granting the status? So it is uh, the authorized by the state or the local radiation safety officer as per the NRC requirements. And okay. uh, there is a certain so NRC revisits its own documents about requirements. And the last they did was in 2019 in November. And they have a set criteria. 
of these are the requirements that we need somebody to become an authorized user. So those requirements are some states have the local uh, radiation safety officers who work with NRC, and some states have their own regulation committees which work with the individual entities or hospital systems. So those are the ones to grant you the authorized user status. Got it. So in terms of the scope of AU status, I mean, is this, are you an authorized user for a specific facility, for a state, or is it nationwide? So it is specific facility, but okay. the license is transferable. So even in, in ah. place, right. So like, for example, the state gives you the license to practice Y90 radiation treatment, all right, you as an authorized user. So me at Einstein, uh, I'll, and we'll talk more about it later, that become what's the difference between the conditional and full authorized user. So let's say for all intents and purposes, if I am a full authorized user here at Einstein and I'm practicing Y90 and I am moving to Ohio or Massachusetts, all it is required by my radiation safety officer to transfer my license to the said entity, which is going to be the hospital system. Yeah. And all it requires, and all they will say that yes, you have fulfilled all the requirements, and they will accept that and move forward as you as an authorized user. Or they may have maybe few minimal requirements where they will say we may want you to do like two or three more cases under some uh, another authorized user's yeah supervise. But you so don't have like to go much. through the whole process. So like pretty much once you become an authorized user, you're an authorized user and, you know, and, and that, that it's transferable and it doesn't expire. Is that correct? Nope. It does not expire. It's forever. Right on. So unless, unless of course, I mean, there's, yeah, there are exceptions. I would, yeah. I wouldn't say forever in a sense that if somebody does something wrong or legit. Yeah. You can lose yeah. it. Correct. Right on. So, you know, as you pointed out, it's important for an interventional radiologist to become an authorized user if they're doing Y90s in practice. I mean, it takes a while to do this. I mean, what does it mean for an IR to uh, to be joining a practice when he or she isn't an authorized user? I mean, what if you can't or you didn't get AU status? Does that mean you can't do Y90s? That's not true. You can do Y90s, except the fact that you are not the authorized user. You are just the person who is selecting the vessels and will be delivering the dose under the guidance of another authorized user which can be an another IR or it can be another nuclear medicine doctor, depending on what your hospital system has set up in place. And yes. which means that you're not dependent on somebody else. And it may or may not be feasible if uh, you go outside in a private practice world where majority of the times you may end up having one physician per practice or one location, then you may have to like run into problems that you may have to have a second authorized user or, or an authorized user in that place for you to do even able to practice. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they, when I started in my last job, that's kind of how it worked. I had to have somebody else around if I was going to be doing a treatment. Right. So obviously there's, you know, there's incentive to do that. You know, you want to be in control of your dosing. You want to be in control of the treatments and you don't have to rely on somebody else to, a absolutely. Uh, to I mean, you don't have to schedule a patient based on when your partner is going to be around. One important aspect of uh, you as an IR becoming an AU is so important is because the way interventional oncology was practiced before, as in like Y19 radiation treatment, see, most of the docs used to do low bar treatments for mm -hmm. uh, tumor control and lobectomy doses. But now with the advent of radiation segmentectomy and depending on what you want to do, the split doses or triple split doses, I have done triple split doses also. It is so important for you to be able to know that because now you can customize the dose based on your case. If you have somebody as a nuclear medicine as an authorized user and they have the authority to order the dose, they are going to be conservative and order what is standard, which totally. is 120 gray. You will have the own flexibility to customize the dosing on case by case basis. There is no flexibility with the other non IR, especially authorized users. But since you have your own license, you design the way you want to do this. And as per the recent uh, paper that just came out, customized and precisely designed doses for the cases have shown to be have very good outcomes, much better than what the low bar treatments used to be. Right on. All right, Rocky, let's move on to the process of becoming an authorized user. You know, we'll get into some of the more recent changes that have made the process a bit murkier and, and more frustrating. First, let's talk about, you know, what an IR traditionally had to do in order to become an authorized user. So since the IR residency has completely changed, uh, as the paradigm has shifted, 
there used to be through a DR pathway that ABR and NRC had an understanding that once you get the ABR certifying exam is done and you get the you become a board certified physician, they would state something called as AUE on the certificate, which means authorized user eligible. And as we all know that the certification exam is 15 months after the graduation. So now that you have taken the exam and it takes about three months approximately, and I'm being very generous to get the results and get the certificate, which obviously takes much more time, but on an average, it takes three months, correct? Yeah. So now, now that's 18 months after your graduation. So now you are authorized user eligible, right? And now you go through all the requirements, which is which includes proctored cases, doing the dose calculations with the already an authorized user, doing box training for TerraSphere's and SirSphere's, and uh, uh, basically uh, the other requirements which every one of us is going to have is like physician, 80 hours of classroom, laboratory training, handling of byproduct material, has a work experience under the supervision of an AU. Of course, you need to be a physician. Those are like the basic requirements. But now think about this. Now you becoming an authorized user will take you at minimum 18 months after graduation. Because if you go through the regular traditional pathway, which is what we are going, but there are other pathways and which is what I think your next question is going to be and what's the additional pathway. Yeah, we're going to have to talk about it because, you know, a lot of the new graduates coming out of IR programs have, have kind of run into like a catch-22 uh, trying to apply for AU status. You know, it's just been all over SIR Connect, people talking about, you know, with the change of an IR DR certificate, the original pathway to do this, we've got some roadblocks. What's going on with that? So, I mean... Rather than exactly a roadblock, it's actually cumbersome. I mean, there are so many requirements and also requires a very, very strong radiation safety officer to expedite your process. And again, our radiation safety officer, Eric Salteke, is phenomenal. Like, he just made it happen for me so quick. So basically, there's an alternate pathway. Now, uh, the alternate pathway basically is exactly all those same requirements, except you do not have to wait for the board certification. Okay. Why? Because on NRC's newly updated document, so the first requirement under the uh, in that NRC's document, there is a section called training and experience. Mm -hmm. Under that section A, there are three separate areas where which says what you need to become an AU. Okay, so as an identified as an AU for medical use of Y90 microspheres, which is the use of sources of manual directly therapy, you have these certain requirements. The third point says meet, meet the training and experience guidelines as you need to be a physician, which is true. Okay. The, and the sub uh, part under that physician is board certification in interventional radiology slash diagnostic radiology by American Board of Radiology, which is the traditional pathway which everybody follows. Sure. The second is, or I'm talking about IRDR, and the second is board certification in diagnostic radiology by ABR. The third is Board Certification in Diagnostic Radiology by American Osteopathic Board of Radiology, which is AOBR. Now, here comes the fourth, which is what we used. The fourth is three years of supervised clinical experience in diagnostic radiology. It's part of the deal, right? Yeah. So we use that as because IRDR residents require three years of diagnostic radiology training. And how can you confirm that? You did it. You just right. ask your program director to write you an email to a radiation safety committee that, yes, he completed three years of radiology. I mean, it's a part of requirement, right? So in PGY-5, you have already completed three years right. of radiology. Now, second part is experience in interventional radiology, right? Which is, again, there are certain ways. Board certification in IRDR. Board subspecialty certification in interventional radiology. Again, the third point is the kicker. One year of supervised clinical experience in interventional radiology. Dude, that's great. So it's called residency. Exactly. Yeah, that's <laughs> called that's called PGY five when you're yeah. going to be on IR for the whole year. So you know, I was really fortunate to have a had a relatively smooth path to becoming an AU after training, but that's primarily because I you know I landed in a in a high volume one ninety practice with staff that kind of navigated that whole thing for me. But your experience is unique, Rocky. Uh, you know, like most people, I. I mean, like most people, I pursued AU status in my first year after training, but you became an AU as a resident, and you're the only trainee I've ever met who's done that. Um, and we're going to talk in a minute about how you did it, but first I want you to tell me why, because, you know, I think I misunderstood the first time we talked, you know, because I, I couldn't imagine like a fully functional 
academic IR department really needed you to be an AU, but you know, there were a lot of benefits to it for you. So I mean, so where did the idea come from and and what was your goal in pursuing this, at least initially? So very interesting question. And I have always uh, thought about this that and sat with my program director. First of all, I can guarantee you, you need a very amazing program director and a radiation safety officer. So you have sure. the ingre- ingredients to get that. So the idea actually generated from that we had two attendings who we had hired who were straight out of fellowship, all right? So for them to become a Y90 authorized user, they haven't taken the board certification exam yet. Interesting. Right? So, yeah. but they went through the process. It took them six months. And that's because they also followed the NRC's pathway, alternate pathway. And it took them six months to go through requirements, reaching back out to their programs, the documentation, the paperwork, and the, the box training, which everybody requires, which is, right. again, the same deal. You right? did it as a resident. But again, when they got it in six months, and I was in a PGY-5 at that time, and I'm like, well, they didn't take the certification exam. Right. What is stopping me from getting that? <laughs> and I sat down with my program director, and I, and he said, well, that's a good point. And you actually have all the Y90 cases that you have done. You have right. done you pretty much do all the dose calculations and ordering and all that stuff along with us. So maybe let's go to radiation safety committee and talk to them. So I presented my case to them, Eric Soltiki, who was amazing. And he's like, this is a very innovative idea. He's the actually one who made it happen. And then when we approached it and radiation safety committee said, well, he's a resident. So we need somebody who's graduated. And I, then my PD and they decided that, well, we can always make him a conditional AU which basically means that we will give him the license. The only thing that will that will be different from the the reason it is conditional is because as a resident, I'm not allowed to bill. Sure. The attending bills it. So I'm a conditional AU. So I have everything required, except I cannot bill. And my attending will be the supervising AU who is going to be billing because it's technically the patients are theirs and I get the experience. Now, this conditional is persistent throughout the year. And once I graduate, this gets converted into a full AU. Ah, that was going to be my next question. So conditional now, and then as soon as you graduate, you know, you can start billing. You're a full-on AU. You don't, right. Do you have to do anything to level up, or is it automatic? Automatic. Man, that's awesome. Did you have to work with the NRC at all, or did this strictly go through Eric, the radiation safety officer? So Eric actually is in charge of, he's and the chairman of radiation safety committees at nuclear medicine attending. And when they had the meeting and then they decided, they put this process together. They approved it that, yes, all the boxes are checkmarked. And then Eric, after giving me the license, he submitted that license and the process of doing it to NRC on the NRC site visit. And NRC were extremely happy and they like, they literally gave us the green light. They said, wow, this is innovative. This is great. You literally guys have gone through the document at every single step. You fulfilled all the requirements and that's it. Dude, I think that's it's a great thing. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned earlier that, you know, this is granted on a on like a local or regional basis. So, you know, what happens when you move from Boston to Baton Rouge to take the job with my group? Uh, are you gonna have to go through this process again? Or you just say, hey, I, I'm an AU already, just transfer here. Exactly. That's the second part, transfer it here. Now, Man. one thing could be, and see, you don't have to go through the process. You are an AU, that's it. You're in NRC's database as an AU. It does not change that. Once you get transferred to a different place, all you can maybe have to do is, depending on the local radiation safety requirements, they may have to tell you that, hey, we don't know how you do the procedures, so we want you to do three proctored cases or two proctored cases or whatever. Yeah, like, that's what I had to do here. I had to, Once I moved, I had to do a proctored mapping, dosing, and a treatment, right. and that was it. But AU, the other part is, see, as you as a practitioner, if you are an AU, it means that somebody has already gone through your whole process. Yeah, It's totally. just like having that a board certification. Sense. I mean, having a board certification in radiology, if we get to transfer in a different place, it doesn't mean that we have to do it again, right? Yeah. Uh, Rocky, so, you know, obviously it was a whole lot easier and faster to do it this way than it it is for most of us who get it after training. What are some of the other benefits aside from easier AU status? Oh, big one, marketing. So now you're going to come out as a fellow. Now you're marketing yourself. 
and looking for jobs. Think about this. Again, maybe it is a great thing for me and eventually, hopefully, once I come out next year, it will be. But think about going into a practice where they have group of whatever number of practitioners. And mind you, majority of the IR practice is still private practice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of private practices may require somebody who's doing, who's an authorized user and may want to kickstart their Y90 program or have an additional hand in Y90 program. Now you join a private practice where it's all about moving fast and making sure your patients are taken care of and all that stuff, right? You're waiting 18 months after this versus you are ready on July. It makes a huge difference, right? Sure. I think another one is just that, you know, having direct experience uh, with dosimetry for these patients and and really having to take the onus of, of you know, writing out these doses and, you know, I, I know it's conditional on us to get approved, but still uh, being heavily involved with the dosing as a, as a trainee is an experience I think that's going to serve you very well. Absolutely. I mean, I, I cannot I cannot tell you more that whenever we send out our prescriptions and it's it's like a group of people who receive the prescription. So like, let's say, for example, my PD, Dr. Bala Narajan, if he has a Y90 case, which I have done the mapping and now I'm doing the calculations, we have, uh, in our place, we have a requirement that two attendings have to verify the dosing. That's cool. Okay. So it's just a safety precaution. It's not like a hard set requirement, but it's it's safe, right? So literally, yeah. I would do it. And at this point, I even write down my name as doses verified by Dr. Naruaj and Dr. Ahuja. And maybe like if the other attendings available. They'll, That's they'll great, man. That's going to be a really good experience for you. Another benefit to this is that filling out this paperwork, you know, far after the fact is a challenge when you no longer live in the city where you train. You sometimes have to get more documentation. You know, you have to kind of hound these people. Being able to have ready access to those people and documents is certainly an so, advantage. So much easier. Yeah. Yeah. I can knock on their door and I'm like, Eric, you forgot to send this document. Can you just do it right now? So look, Rocky, I was going to finish up by asking you to kind of, you know, make your pitch to the medical students and trainees. But honestly, I, th I think you've made it pretty clear that at the very least, all the trainees out there, you know, once you get to the end of your training, you need to at least consider doing this because, yeah, I you know, I don't know if it's going to be transferable to, to different states, but, you know, uh, I'm certainly convinced. And if this option had been available to me, it's something that I would have gone for. Yeah, I mean, think about this as in like a medical student or a trainee. Let's be honest. IO has become the fourth pillar of treatment for cancer. And wherever you go, IO is something that there is no turf wars in IO, right? It is you. It is the IR people doing IO. Unless there is a subspecialty which may come in future. But at this time, given the fact that you having that license and you having the authority to prescribe the doses and give the doses and treat the patient and follow them up, it makes you not just like a very marketable person, but you own the patient. It's ownership, right? That's what we talk about all the time. Sure. And it is real estate. It's possible. I did it. And I think it's very, very much the fact that, yes, it can be done. In fact, Eric and his community is also going to distribute to different radiation safety officers that Good. How he was, how he managed to do it from his side, you know. Yeah, and I think we can expect this to be published somewhere in the next year or so. And certainly, there, this is a good way to get the word out. And uh, yeah. you know, it's exciting what you've done, and uh, interested to see what you stir up in Boston and beyond. Rocky, thank yeah. you for joining us, and thanks to all of our listeners for for tuning into the Back Table Podcast. Is is there anything else I didn't cover that you want to talk about? I think you you hit the nail on the spot right away. All right, man. Well, thank you for having me. It yeah, was, dude, thanks uh, for wonderful coming. speaking to you. Detailed description with step-by-step -step approach will be available in an article published in American Journal of Interventional Radiology. We are grateful to AJIR for publishing our work and helping us spread the word about becoming a 190 authorized user as an IR resident. <laughs>